So I'm especially excited for Roland to be here because his work for me is a total digital package. In the already highly specialized field of digital design and fabrication, there's an increasing tendency for people to specialize even more um, to the point where people become so specialized and experts in a particular technique or method of working that they often become disconnected from the practice of architecture. And it's very difficult to re reconnect these techniques to the practice of architecture. Um, well, I appreciate, what I appreciate most about Roland's work is that it deals with these very highly specialized techniques and tools. Um, and uh, he does so in a way that moves across many of these techniques simultaneously. So instead of focusing on one particular tool, he uses all of them and always in relationship to buildings and architecture, which I think is really essential to how digital design and fabrication is progressing and it's sort of a necessary path. Um, Roland Snooks is a partner of the Experimental Research Collaborative in India. Do I say that right? Kukuja? Kukuja. Okay. And director of the architecture practice studio, Roland Snooks. Roland's architectural design research is focused on behavioral uh, processes of formation that draw from the logic of swarm intelligence and operate through multiple or multi-agent algorithms. In addition to his work with algorithmic design, Roland directs the architectural robotics lab at RMIT University. He holds a master's in advanced architectural design from Columbia University where he studied on a Fulbright scholarship after graduating from RMIT. Roland is currently a lecturer in architecture at RMIT and holds a visiting position at the University of Pennsylvania, having previously directed design studios and seminars at the Pratt Institute, SciArc, UCLA, and USC, and recently at Texas A&M, where he worked with Gabe. Um, his work has been exhibited in the FRAC collection in France, where it is now in the permanent collection. The Beijing Biennial, where Kukuja was the 2008 and 2010 Australian curators, and the National Gallery of Victoria. His work has been published widely, including the recent book, Architecture and Formation, on the nature of architecture, or the nature of information in the digital architecture, which I just got in the mail like a week ago. It's a great book. And the journal Log, to name just a few. So please join me in welcoming Roland Snooks. Uh, Corey, thank you very much for the introduction. And it's um, it's very nice to hear you talk about the ambitions of our work in the way that we actually see our, our ambitions. I mean, it is something that we've um, this connection between algorithmic design and um, the core of architectural concerns is something that has always been, I guess, very close to what we do, and in some ways how we perhaps differentiate our work from some of our contemporaries. Um, so. I have two, two practices. One is a, a research practice called Kuja, and this is um, it's a research collaborative that I started with Rob Stewart Smith uh, about 10 years ago now. And this was really set up to try and explore algorithmic design. And it was looking at processes, self organizing processes that operate within um, biological, material, or, or social systems, and look at how we could use those self-organizing processes as a way of designing. Um, um, more recently, I've established a new practice which is focused on building. So Studio Roland Snooks, it's a shift from um, purely experimentation to how that experimentation is, I guess, instantiated or how it operates through actual architectural projects. So what I'm talking about today is going to be work from both those practices. And in particular, I guess the, the overall framework for the work is it's partly about algorithmic design uh, I'm going to show some work with digital fabrication and robotics. Um, but all of it comes through something that can be described as generative design. It's something that I'm sure you're very familiar with, but it's this idea that uh, you design the design process as much as you're designing the thing. So it's setting up a series of uh, let's say abstract conditions from which the building emerges, as opposed to directly operating or designing um, designing things directly. So complex systems and their algorithmic tools have been extensively mined over the last decade within architecture. <coughs> While complex systems and their emergent phenomena increasingly define our understanding of becoming, our understanding of formation, emergence has, well, it, it evades, um, or some of those contradicts notions of architectural authorship or the role of design intention. And more specifically, a lot of the algorithms that are beginning to be used within architecture are actually incapable of dealing with architectural problems or architectural intention. The design projects and research that I'm going to discuss today speculate on the interwoven relationship between these two concerns, so that of emergence and of design intention. And in particular, this is an attempt to try and explore the relationship between things that are systemic and things that are subjective. 
When we first started working on algorithmic design, we were tempted to explore or try and define or articulate an architecture of small intelligence. So this was a sort of purist uh, methodological position. But increasingly you'll see in our work that there's a shift into an interest in the sort of strange esoteric qualities of the work, the uh, intensive effectual capacities of the work, um, and how this emerges through the interaction of top-down and bottom-up um, approaches. Our work is obviously part of a larger contemporary exploration that's going on within architecture, um, a larger interest in algorithmic design and computation. I'd say that the original territory that we've tried to carve out within this is to do with the relationship between architectural intention and emergent processes, and in particular the way intention is embedded within those processes. So not two things that operate in some abstract relationship. Uh, the processes, it's an attempt to reconceptualize, reconceptualize design intention as behaviors that locally interact. So it's this idea that you can embed architectural intention into a system which then self-organizes. This is something we describe as, as behavioral formation. The particular subset of complexity theory that's been most influential in our work is swarm intelligence. Swarm intelligence describes collective behavior where a series of, I'll describe them as agents, in this case as birds, are interacting based on a series of local conditions. So the bird has no understanding of the overall flock. It's just relating to the birds that are immediately adjacent to it. But through a whole lot of very small, very simple interactions, very complex behavior emerges at the large scale. So we're interested in the way that the type of emerging conditions that are happening in this, in this flock can be seen as a way of designing. So swarm intelligence operates in, in natural systems, biological systems, such as flocks of birds, schools of fish, in social insects, in the way ants build ant bridges, or the way termites reorganize uh, material in order to create uh, termite mounds, or the way slime mold self-organizes. In this case, on the left-hand side, you can see it self-organizing to make minimal path routes to get to, um, to, get to food. So these are very simple systems. I mean, slime mold are single cell creatures with no particular intelligence of their own, but the coordination and feedback between them develops a, a swarm intelligence. The work that we've done algorithmically draws heavily on the work of Craig Reynolds. Now, Craig Reynolds was an animator and a complexity theorist working in the mid-80s for Sony, and he developed something known as the Boyd's algorithm. This is an algorithm that was used to simulate flocking and scoring. Originally, there was a, this um, assumption that flocks of birds came about through some lead bird or some form of imitation. And by writing this algorithm, Reynolds was able to demonstrate that actually it's based on distributed behavior, which means there's no overall control, but it's simply by the local interactions of each of the birds that generates that behavior. So in this case, you can see there's three behaviors that he outlined, cohesion, separation, and alignment, basically trying to stay close to the neighbors, avoid colliding with them, and matching the speed and direction. Now, in taking this algorithm and starting to develop a body of architectural work from it, it's not an attempt to try and make architecture somehow biological. Like we're not trying to make our architecture swarm-like, flock-like in any way. What we're trying to do is say, as an architect, can we take our intention, um, not think about at the macro scale of the building, but break it down to a series of small decisions, look at the way the small decisions interact, and what type of emergent architecture comes about through this process. So in doing so, while flocks and schools deal with what is the agency of a point, um, the way points interact with each other, uh, we look at the way you can embed agency in a series of higher level geometries. So the types of geometries we need for architecture, so things like lines, networks or meshes, uh, increasingly in something um, in components, something we describe as, as agencies. <coughs> this is a small catalog showing some of the types of behaviors that we, we write, and it's a attempt to try and take architectural decisions, break them down into simple geometric moves. Uh, a behavior can be described in several ways. On the left-hand side, there's a diagram explaining the way an agent responds to its neighbors. Then there's the summation of vectors. There's the code written out as a series of plain English steps, and then the uh, computer code that we write. So a behavior in itself is fairly simple. Um, it's the interaction of these behaviors that generate something greater than the sum of its parts. Multi-agent systems 
don't operate through um, let's say <laughs> binary conditions where it's like either or, but instead what happens is because it's the influence of a series of behaviors. So agents always have a tendency to do something, but never an absolute condition. And so it's always this tendency of behaviors that we're trying to mine for what characteristics they can produce. Recently in trying to categorize the types of strategies that we've used, design strategies, design processes, through our work, we developed this timeline which shows our work going back with multi-agent systems um, about 12 years. And the different, a series of different strategies we've used and the way they've bundled through different projects and hybridized within different projects. So I'm going to use this as a way of outlining this lecture today, talk through each of those strategies and, um, and try and explain them through, um, through a series of projects. So the first of these is fibrous assemblages. Now, material is not, um, are not homogenous. Materials are made up of um, particularly organic material. It's made up of uh, micro scale um, elements. And it's the geometry of these elements and the behavior in terms of the way they relate to each other, which gives a material its tendencies or its behaviors, its, um, its characteristics. So in understanding this, we started to work on algorithmic design processes in which we take a line and we look for a fiber and look at the way that fiber relates to other fibers and then the types of patterns and geometries and forms it generates at different scales. And this is something which doesn't have a hierarchy in it. Hierarchies emerge from that. I'll discuss that more later. Uh, it also has a sort of very fuzzy relationship between line and, line and surface. So technically the way this works, we have a series of agents and these agents sort of draw a line between them, behind them as they move. And those lines have another level of agency. Those lines can start to move and bundle and, and respond to each other. And they're responding not in a hierarchical way, it's a nonlinear way, so it's a mutual relationship between lines. The first project we worked on with this strategy in 2008 was a, a this, well this is the first of a series of towers, we call it the Argus Tower. And it's looking at a concrete uh, load bearing uh, skin or shell, um, which is trying to negotiate between a series of different architectural decisions, I guess we're trying to make. Now, this strategy comes partly from a reading of Frato's work. Um, Frato, a German engineer and architect, um, working predominantly, I guess, in the, um, in the 70s and 80s. This is an experiment where he is taking woolen strands, connecting them through a whole lot of points. And the left-hand image, I would describe as an image of periodic order. So it's order, but it's repeating. The next image has got noise or um, randomness built into it. So he, he lengthens each of those, <coughs> those woolen strands. And then they're dipped in water. Uh, and the water pulls together those strands. And then this image is making a self-organized order. So this is, these are, it's a good example of the types of order I'll discuss today between the periodic um, noise or randomness and self-organization. So obviously, the self-organization that is the, the aspect that's affecting our work the most. So we started to write digital behaviors for these. Like how might lines want to interact with other lines? What is their agency? What is their behavior? And what types of patterns um, and geometries do they create? And how's, how might this be used in architecture? One thing we began to realize about this is you can put in a, a uniform field, like no, without hierarchy, but the hierarchy starts to emerge from it. And so you can start to see here that you have a whole lot of different conditions occurring, you've got um, major bundling, which creates, I guess, a, a sort of primary structure, an emergent primary structure. And you have a series of smaller cellular conditions. And we're interested in the way that we can move across scales with this. So this is an example of um, trying to make an architecture which is not separated into discrete parts. So if modernism, or particularly, say, classical modernism, was trying to separate architecture out into a whole lot of discrete elements, um, where that's form, surface, structure, articulation, ornament. We were interested in the way a single body of material can negotiate between all of, the, all of those things. So instead of saying that um, an architectural role has a piece of geometry, like the need to hold something up becomes a column, or becomes a beam, we're interested in the way that uh, structure becomes a behavior that interacts with other behaviors through a material. So in this case, through concrete. So this is an example where that concrete shell has compressed um, structure, uh, ornament to a degree, although it's not as ornamental as we'd like, um, enclosure, and at certain points it starts to swell up and become spatial as well. Increasingly we're interested in how we can take this work out of the computer and start to figure out how to build them. 
this project was originally based on the assumption that we would um, we'd make the formwork through a combination of traditional and, and new methods. So to have plywood form that we cast concrete into, but then have a series of milled foam spaces. If they were attached to either side, you'd be able to get these types of geometries. So the geometry in part is dictated or constrained by its construction technique. So we've made a series of examples where we used, um, we milled those types of molds. Increasingly, with the robotics that we have at RMIT, we're starting to look at other ways of doing this and what is the role of the tool and how it will affect the architecture we make. So this is a very, very simple process, I guess, for the robot where it picks up a piece of foam and it's carving that block of foam uh, with a hot wire. So the same technique that many architecture students will of course, use to make models, um, this is something we do quite precisely and potentially at a large scale. So all the, all the bits that are carved off, we take those out, we use those as formwork. Um, here's a series of different examples of different geometries we can make. The geometry has changed from the previous example. That one was limited by um, three-axis milling. This is limited by a ruled surface, so a surface that's made from a straight line. And then using that formwork in order to cast concrete. So this is just a small test, but we're looking at the way um, with each new tool and we have the way it starts to feed back into the design and affect the things that we design. Okay, so stepping back, this that was a recent um, experiment. This is a um, sort of intermediate project. This was looking at what would happen if we increased the volatility of the system. So in the first tower project, the algorithmic aspect of the project was limited to the shell. Like, it was con constrained to a surface that we had modeled. With this one, we gave the agents much more freedom to sort of to weave and weave inside the space, and in this case, to try and make things which might be uh, spaces for atriums, etc. But the extra volatility was given, the extra freedom the system was given, and more volatile, it made a whole series of different types of um, characteristics. Um, different types of qualities uh, became at a finer grain, became more ornamental in its qualities. Okay, the second technique or strategy I want to talk about is polyscalar tectonics. Polyscalar tectonics, it's it relates to fractals and it relates to uh, self-similarity. The idea that the same operation happens at a series of different scales. So it might be the same operation or the same type of geometry. This, once again, causes a blurring between architectural role and architectural geometry. So there's no longer a single piece of geometry that defines um, an architectural role, but those get blurred across scale. So this brings me to two projects that were done in Texas. Um, these were done with Gabe at uh, Texas A&M. Um, some of the students who work on these projects are here today. Uh, there were two houses. This was funded through a grant through the, um, the Mitchell Lab <coughs> for the future. And these two projects are sort of like the, the twins, but one's the evil twin, and this one's the evil one. Um, I don't know if it's more flat. Uh, this is trying to just push this logic of polyscalar strands to its logical conclusion. And instead of constraining them between the surface, they're given a lot more freedom. And in this case, um, they're generating form as well as generating articulation. So it's, um, it's asking the question, what would happen if you, if you make an architecture completely from a line and didn't constrain it to, um, to a known set of forms? So it makes these very kind of weird, very, very strange, fibrous things, um, which exhibit this polyscalar quality where um, line operates at the level of form, the structure, even down to matting together to make a type of surface. There's a few small chunks of these. Now, one of the things that was really interesting working with, with Gabe at a &M was making these, um, testing this at the level of a prototype. And this is something that started to my work increasingly. Um, we want to get these things out of the computer and, and test them at a um, prototypical scale. So this is um this is the first of those. It's um it has a very raw um, quality, but we'll try in this case we'll try to capture the characteristics of it more than the um, than the precise geometry. So unlike something like three D printing where you're directly producing the digital model, this is actually about when the guys were laying down these fibers. It was partly based on the um, the three D model and partly based on trying to follow the rules that existed within the algorithm. 
So it becomes sort of a manual algorithm. So this is the not so evil twin. This one is uh, called this one the Cliff House. It's supposed to be in Nevada. Um, this one's really asking the question of the material and saying, if you have a high performance material like composites, um, in fiberglass in this case, what are its structural capacities? And what type of, if we gave it a very extreme site so we could, we could test to see what would happen at that level. Now, this project is much more informed by surface. So you can see here there's a constant going back and forth between um, generating the lines for the aided systems and modeling surfaces and then constraining one to the other. Um, I'll talk more about that later. It sort of forms a, a strange feedback <coughs> between the two. Um, but in doing so, the, these have polyscalar um, qualities. There are a series of these um, it's a hierarchies that were developed. Um, and then they produced a series of, I guess, very um, very deep aesthetic in a way, in that um, what are quite thin surfaces get layered up and have a depth to them. So we're interested in the way this might react both during the day and at night. Um, you know, how they differ from when lights on them to lights behind them. Um, how these silhouettes emerge from them. And, and again, testing at the level of a, uh, <coughs> of a prototype. Take this, this chunk, try to build it. Uh, whereas a lot, this one is a slightly, slightly different technique. It had something that was embedded inside it, which we started calling the cartilage. This is sort of a belt-like element, which um, partly for um, aesthetic reasons, partly for structural reasons, it absorbed a lot of the, of the resin. We have a, a thickness to it. Um, also working with the um, with aerospace engineering. And one of the realizations is the building is perhaps more likely to take off and fall down due to screen light weight than the hot air rising over the cliff. This is a competition entry for the Taipei Performing Arts Center in Taiwan. Um, most, a lot of the work we do is through, through competitions. Sometimes we, we're working, like the previous project, at a sort of experiment or just a, a test, whereas this is something where we're starting to try and figure out how our design processes interact with a real freedom um, and real constraints. So this is sort of the first major competition we did, this is 2008, I think. And the building has three parts to it. So it has um, a fractally subdivided base, a series of auditoriums, three auditoriums, and this, um, this overarching roof. We looked at a series of algorithms. The first of them was a fractal subdivision algorithm. So this is something that keeps on replacing um, a shape with um, smaller versions of itself, um, generating more and more detail and complex patterns in the process. We look at those in both 2D and 3D. So uh, how we can start to erode a mass. And this was <coughs> trying to erode the, the podium, the plinth of this building. And it's partly to try and bring it down to a human scale. It's quite a massive project. And partly trying to make it relate to the scale of the um, adjacent light market. Inside the auditoriums, we're using this as a way of breaking down the surface for acoustic reasons uh, and, or and ornamental reasons. And this was partly a reaction to, um, I guess, a nostalgia that we have for some of the, um, the 19th century, 18th to 19th century um, performance halls, operas, which have a kind of richness to them that's been lost in much contemporary architecture. So look, this one's looking at three-dimensional fractal subdivision. This one says so this one is in the opera house. But look, our main focus and the focus I want to discuss tonight is the the way the roof works. And this is, I guess, the first project where we started to deal with um, bottom-up algorithmic process and its relationship to top-down um, decisions. So the roof of this project was originally modeled um, directly, explicitly modeled in a um, software package. And then we decided which parts of the roof had to be fixed and which parts were able to start to reform in some way. So th there are certain parts of this roof which were able to have greater freedom and greater volatility. So you can see that this surface begins to break down into a, into a network of lines. And we're interested in blurring relationships between types of geographies. So this is a blurring between surface and, and line, surface and strand. In the end, you could probably argue that it wasn't very successful because there's actually a kind of rupture or break between the two. We end up with a surface on top and a space frame beneath it. It doesn't sort of have the seamless relationship 
between the two that we're interested in. But this sort of became the, the start of, of many of these, um, these strand projects. In trying to develop a design process which is highly dependent on a multi-agent algorithm. So a multi-agent algorithm, of course, one that um, looks at, at things immediately adjacent to it, but doesn't look at the entire system. This is something known as global ignorance. This idea that the system, or the agent in the system, is ignorant of the, of the entire system. So what we've done is we've, I guess we've invented a problem that has implications for architecture in that some parts of architecture um, you can only understand if you understand it at the global level. Like at the level of the entire building, not the level of one part of the building. So one, and these are inherently what I describe as topological. They're about connection. They're about the way things are connected to things. Now, uh, this affects problems such as enclosure. Um, you need to understand the total enclosure of a building. Also, structure. You can't analyze one part of a structure without analyzing all of the structure. So, it's sort of a problem we've invented for ourselves, and now we're spending years trying to sort of you know, solve this problem and. Some of the following strategies are attempts to solve this. The first of them is the strange feedback strategy. And this is this idea that some things we're going to do um, directly and just as a top-down modeling process, and some things we're going to, um, to work on as a bottom-up system, so it's an algorithmic system, and work on going between the two. So if the first, um, if the type A project with the green roof, that was about doing the top-down first, modeling something, and then looking at the way parts that will start to reform. In this project that we worked on with, as a collaboration with Tom Wiscombe, an architect based in LA, we were looking at a much messier feedback between the two. So it's this idea that one, it's not that top down comes before bottom up, but it's sort of a battle between them. And this was almost um, a way of exploring different ways that Tom and I, um, Tom and I design the way we work. So this is an expo pavilion. Um, it was designed for the 2012 Korea Expo. It was a competition we lost. We lose all our competitions. And it's a sort of pointing sea monster. Um, the theme of the expo was about water, and it was about... Um, it, was, it was a kind of complex thing about man's relationship with water, but um, Tom and I, in our first conversation, said, yeah, it should be a sea monster. It should be this kind of weird thing that's looked like it's a reason from the deep. Um, it's a series of objects, so it's a series of um, sort of avocado or egg-shaped things which are connected by um, a much stiffer uh, membrane. Tom's been doing a lot of work over the last several years with um, objects and objects within objects, and this was the, one of the first projects in, that, in which that was developed, and you can start to see some of these, these um, eggs within other volumes, and you can see that in the section as well. Or the way one volume starts to impinge on another volume. Through this messy back and forth, strange feedback process between the explicit and the emergent, uh, it generated a polyscalar um, set of characteristics once again. So in, in this project, there's a blur between which one, which of these geometric moves are for spatial reasons about organization, which are formal, which are structural, um, which get down to an ornamental level. So there's sort of a, the same operation repeated, but a blurring across scales of these. The algorithm that was written for the project is a type of branching agent algorithm, so agents are producing more agents and, and branching out. Um, and this is one of the sort of windows of the project, and it's the most pure application of the, of the algorithm. But we're constantly going between this and then trying to model these things. So it was this process of, of writing the algorithm, running it, seeing what it produces, trying to then model what's being produced. What we learn from modeling, we feed back into the algorithm and vice versa. So it's constant back and forth. You know, and they produced a series of sort of strange Frankensteins at times. But eventually that resolved itself into a fairly seamless or coherent um, architectural vocabulary. So it's sort of like this uh, coherent vocabulary came out of this inconsistent back and forth process. One of the, projects, one of the I guess, aspects of this project that's interesting is color and the way color has tendencies, but it's not what I describe as indexical. What I mean by that is that the, the tips of the um, tentacles get brighter, um, they get more yellow, 
But this is not a, um, always an indexical relationship. It's not a one-to-one -one relationship, but it's a tendency that exists within it. It's in the same way that the, the geometry has a tendency to do certain things, that the agents have tendencies to do certain things, but it's never um, causal, never one-to-one. -one. Uh, we worked with um, a brilliant young engineer, Matt Melnick, on the project. He seems to think it might work. Um, and it has a few different levels of inflation operating in it. So the space is inflated to a certain degree, like in the way many um, the football stadiums or sporting stadiums are inflated. But then there's also a micro set of veins going across these um, sort of transparent membranes, and those veins give stiffness to it as well. One of the things that Tom's office is very good at, and um, we're increasingly doing, is operating at the level of a chunk. So resolving things at a small, uh, a small scale and then developing it up to something which is larger um, as opposed to dealing with a series of, of set scales. So in, the, in these chunks, everything is sort of developed from the structure, the space, the aesthetics, and the public And looking at some of these, afterwards I've begun to realize that the polyscalar qualities of these are actually quite gothic. Like they, when you cut a section through these, you see almost this gothic crochet. So this image is from a competition that we were shortlisted on in China. So it's the um, National Art Museum of China. It's in Beijing. It's part of the Olympic site. It's a few hundred meters north of the Burzner Stadium. It's a very interesting site because it's a site which has a series of massive object monuments. So the Burzner Stadium, um, the water cube, a series, of, a series of other objects. And the brief is for the largest museum in the world. And so. I guess the question we've got is, are we going to try and compete with these other objects and have another object-like thing? Um, it's too, the building's too big to completely bury, so we can't do that. So we can't make it a non-object. A non so we started thinking about formless form and, and in particular clouds, and the way that a cloud is not, I mean, cloud is a formal thing, it has a, a form, but it also has a, a certain diffuse or formless quality to it. Um, it's also, clouds play an important role in, in Chinese culture and art. Um, so we worked on this project as a collaboration with um, uh, Du Pei, a um, Beijing-based architect. This is, this is a, um, a strange feedback process. So it's a, it's a process going back and forth between um, the explicit model and the, uh, and the algorithmic process. Now in doing so, this is perhaps one of our more successful images in getting a seamless relationship between articulation and form. So I think our worst projects are projects in which we model something and then we have some algorithmic articulation of that and there is this, you know, disjunction. One is applied to the other. In this, um, there's enough back and forth that happen that have a seamless relationship such that even this, sort of, this thin surface appears to have a depth to it. It appears to have, like, it appears as a volume rather than a surface. Um, now, Trying to make a formless form when it's the size of the world's largest museum is not going to work. It's always going to be form, a really big one. Um, and so we're constantly working back and forth between these two ways of modeling um, to make this admittedly out of scale, which is a large thing. Um, I'll explain a, few, few, a little bit about the way it works. Uh, it's a series of large concrete beams, um, three stories, so two, two and three story beams. Um, these overlap each other and become the main primary structure of the building. Then from this is propped off the, um, the cloud structure. Uh, the brief called for some pretty standard gallery spaces and what we've done is do some standard gallery spaces, some top lit spaces and then sort of these in-between spaces which become, uh, I guess, less formal, uh, less formal gallery spaces. So you can see it's sort of a highly expressive structure and we're, once again we're trying to get a relationship between structure and articulation and form. Um, and down to the level of the, the scales of the shingles. So the project has, um, has identical um, glass shingles, which are about six foot um, in, in width. And, um, but they, the way they join together allows them to overlap and to create fairly non standard patterns and forms. So this is a model of ours, um, which we'll look at that. So here's, um, here's one of the tests of those, those shingles. Um, and we a model where you see the relationship between the shingles and the form. Um, 
Other parts of the interior um, in the circulation spaces took the four plates and started to fold those together to make vertical areas of vertical, vertical circulation. And we are always trying to find um, ways to design you know, every part of the project. This is the paving pattern. And this is looking at um, uh, a way of corrupting a Voronoi algorithm. Some of you probably know what a Voronoi algorithm is, but it has a very distinctive ca formal characteristic. Like when you see it, you know, you know what it is. Um, what we're trying to do with this is work out a way of um, subverting that to a certain extent. And using the same logic, but something that was capable of generating um, a pattern that wasn't indexed to its process. And this is something that um, we're quite critical of in architectural design. We think a lot of architects who are using algorithmic processes are actually just selecting processes which already come in complete with a, an aesthetic and set of organizational relationships. And what we're interested in doing is like, how can we actually rewrite these algorithms and give them their own sort of unique characteristics? Um, in losing all our competitions, you sort of assume that those projects go nowhere, but this is um, this, the sea monster that time when I worked on led to this project. So this is another expo. Um, five years later, this is the 2017 World Expo in Kazakhstan. It's a large project, it's not a single pavilion, it's about seven large pavilions um, and then a bunch of um, um, other small pavilions on the site and um, I guess the, the larger urban design of the entire site. The pavilion, the, the whole expo, so the last one was about water, this one's about energy, um, and it has some symbol about the last drop of, um, of oil, and it's of course talking about sort of the new energy paradigm and renewable energy. And this is partly because Kazakhstan is a, um, it's an oil and natural gas rich country. It's been becoming very rich very quickly from natural resources, but also can see that those resources will be depleted soon. And so it's looking towards the future. Um, so we started to think about a natural resource, a um, natural energy source of wind, and the whole project comes about how we can, uh, we can visualize the wind, we can use wind as a, an architectural generator, like a, as, as a design generator, um, and what's the relationship between sort of simulation, representation, and, um, and energy collection. So these are some of the smaller pavilions on the side. Um, sort of more generic ones to do. And then there's this thing. Um, every, every expo has some crazy big monument that they build, like Paris had the Eiffel Tower. Um, Kazakhstan's, um, well, it's not going to have this because we lost the competition, but um, <laughs> we have this. And uh, what is it? It's, um, it's this hairy thing is all these hairs are using technology called piezoelectric, and basically it's when you compress the material. It generates electricity, and the idea is these um, these hairs wave in the wind, and in doing so, um, they generate they generate power. And so this was an attempt to try and make something where the form is generated from a um, um, a process that mimics the wind. Um, it generates electricity from the wind, and because you see all these hairs moving around, it visualizes the, the flow of wind across the surface as well. Um, that's one way of describing the project. Um, another way of describing the project is that when um, when Rob, my partner, Kuja, went over to visit Kazakhstan and met the president of Kazakhstan, he realized a few things about the city that's in Astana. Um, Astana is full of like big gold monuments. Uh, most of them are like platonic solids. Um, and so he realized pretty quickly that the president, who's also the head of the jury, loves gold. He also loves horses and loves eagles. So this is a big, hairy horse <laughs> eagle, golden horse eagle, that generates electricity. Um, sometimes I have to try and appeal to the jury. It didn't work. We lost. Um, anyway, it was quite a, it was a fun project to work on, obviously. Um, so it looks like it might take off um, a few plans, trying to convince people. Um, okay, so um, in a, looking in another direction, the next strategy is agent bodies. So this is a way of putting uh, agency into, into a component and look at where those components might reorganize and relate to each other and generate typically tectonic, tectonic strategies. So it goes back to well, ornamental and tectonic strategies. Um, this goes back to the ant bridge idea, the idea that the agent itself might reach out and grab onto the other agents around it 
with its arms and legs and to make some sort of architectural or, um, or structural geometry. The first project we developed this on in 2009, this was a started as lap as a ceiling for a competition entry we're doing for the Polish National History Museum. Uh, the project was the the building was perhaps not as interesting as the study of the ceiling. And this was a, a project in which uh, it demonstrates complex order, I think, in quite a quite a successful way. In that there's a figure that emerges from this field. So this field, this is starts off as a field, but the field is no longer like a uniform mass. Um, but what's happened is some sort of figure has emerged, which we can, I guess, um, identify at a larger scale. But as you start to zoom in, you see a series of smaller, um, unique characteristics. So you have these sort of wing-like characteristics, sometimes like a little bit like a butterfly wing. At other points, there are um, periodic elements. So you see something that's re repeating. You zoom in further, you start to see these, um, uh, these symmetries. Uh, it's not, they're not exact symmetries. They're not symmetries that come about through the code or through the component or the body. They're symmetries which have emerged through the interaction of these things. And these are the kind of characteristics and qualities that are always looking for. And they're the sorts of, um, it's the strange characteristics that uh, we use to evaluate this stuff. So a lot of the questions I get about this work is, you know, what is your criteria for success in this? Like, how do you evaluate what is, is better, how one thing is better than another when you're doing so many iterations? And I guess, you know, um, we're not judging these based on, obviously, issues of optimization or some sort of performance. We're judging them on the way they're able to negotiate between a whole series of different architectural criteria, but as well as um, on a level, at a level of strangeness. And we constantly find ourselves talking about, is something sufficiently strange? And this is one of those things that, at the time, I mean, it's, strangeness gets normalized, I guess. And you, know, you see something a few times, it's no longer strange something you understand. But initially, something that's strange is something which you can't um, immediately determine if it's beautiful or if it's, if it's ugly, but somewhere between other times at that block. This technique re-emerged in this project. This is a, it's a Holocaust museum in Kiev uh, at Baba Yar. Now, most projects we deal with are trying to make a synthesis of things. So we're trying to synthesize structure and ornament, or we're trying to make articulation and volume come together as one seamless thing. This is, a, I guess, uh, an outlier in that sense in our body of work. This is not attempting to make something seamless, but it's actually trying to exaggerate the differences between things, trying to make some sort of conflict in the project, develop the tension in the project. Um, so for the jury, we're trying to, just, we're trying to um, make some diagrams, make it work a bit more understandable. Nobody understands what we do, so it's that simple. Um, we always enter these big competitions, we always lose. And sometimes, like the, um, the Taipei project we lost to Rem Kulhas, that's not, that's not so bad. Sometimes we lose to you know, really quite terrible firms. Um, this one we decided, we're sick of entering these competitions when there's you know, 500 or 700 people who enter and you have no chance of winning. And we'll enter the, a small obscure competition that's not enough people to work So we entered this. A small obscure competition with good prize money for second place. Because we know we're never going to win, but we might just be in security for second place. So we entered this competition, and um, it had quite a good prize for second place. Um, and we thought, oh, there's no way any more than 20 or 50 people would, would do this competition. And in the end, they had seven people, and then they cancelled the competition. So, um, so it's always this, you know, don't go too small, don't go too large. Um, we, this is the landscape, the pattern for the landscape. Um, and it starts off by, by thinking that the landscape is not a, uh, a, not a blank site, but it's a charged site. So we set up a series of, I guess, ch different um, intensities on the site, and then we have had our multi agent algorithm start to navigate those intensities. And, and I'm showing a few different iterations of this as a way of describing that when we do algorithmic work, it's not a matter of writing an algorithm and running it and just accepting what it, um, what it produces, but we're constantly going through and running many iterations. I mean, usually you know, 50, 100, 700 iterations. And as we do that, we're going back and rewriting the algorithm, we're changing the parameters, and we're fine-tuning this thing and going back <coughs> to create something that we see as, as being successful. So that's produced the landscape. Um, on top of the landscape, there is this, this sort of monolithic object, and we're interested in the way that this is, you know, it's, uh, it's made from stone, so it looks like it's a very heavy thing, but it's also, you know, it's cantilever, it's trying to fly at some point. Um, as you get closer to it, you see that the exterior of this is um, um, 
smooth stone, but then the uh, memorial, which is sort of inverted memorial, so the idea is it's not a memorial as an object, but it's a memorial as a space. Um, this bronze memorial is, um, is intricate and it's intense um, versus the sort of smooth monolithic exterior. So this is, um, this is a space which is trying to evoke some sort of visceral response. It's trying to get people to have a fairly, I guess, intense um, emotional response to the space. We're not trying to convey a particular meaning. Like people have read into this various things. Like some people have told me it looks like flames or it looks like um, they're melting your bodies together. And so, none of those are deliberate um, associations, but there's a certain intricacy or intensity to the space that we're very deliberate about creating. Um, in terms of the, so the algorithmic side of this, this is a, it's an age of bodies project. The body is fairly simple in this case. Um, the interaction of, of lots of those bodies make these quite intricate and complex um, forms. Now, you can see here there's also uh, another um, contradiction, I guess, between the intensity of the memorial space compared to the museum, where the museum has this very sort of, um, I guess, still um, contemplated spaces. With this um, back wall of, of the memorial, we get some sense of something of in human space, but I'm not entirely sure what that might be. Okay, another, another model of that. This was a model that's developed with back collection. That project led to this project in some ways in terms of the types of geometries we're exploring. So in our work, we're trying to resist um, let's say normative architectural tropes and normative ar architectural articulation. We're trying to make these things not really look like buildings, I guess, but I'm saying it. Sometimes we do that by developing algorithmic processes that develop their own characteristics. Sometimes we're importing characteristics from elsewhere. This is an example where we're taking geological you know, rock-like forms and we're trying to use that as a way of delaying um, sort of architectural recognition of things that look like, like buildings. So um, this is an interesting interesting site. It's in Malibu, in California, and it's sort of overlooking the Pacific Ocean. And from what I understand, it's very hard to get a planning permit in Malibu. But, so our, our client bought this block of land, which already had planning approval for a, um, a Spanish mission-style mansion on it. And apparently, if what you design um, fits entirely inside the envelope of the existing planning, approved planning, you can pass it off as a minor design change and don't have to go back to planning. So um, I think the planning crew is not such a problem in Austin, but it is a problem in Melbourne. Um, so this is a minor design change to a Spanish mission style mansion. Um, you can see in the, in the cyan line, the blue line, um, just you can make out the, um, the Spanish mission style mansion. <laughs> um, just snuck that corner in there. Um, in that so you can see that it was, this, it was this pretty fun little battle of trying to like manipulate this rock to fit inside a mansion. Um, there, there is a more generative part to the project as well, which is this, this surface. This is a surface which is um, part ceiling, part column, part chimney, part stair. Um, it's trying to do all those things at, at once, negotiate between them. And then the pattern that's created on that is a negotiation between something that's ornamental, a certain type of graphic quality we're after, and something which is, is structural at the same time. So that's the pattern. And it obviously relates to projects like the Argus Tower, it's one of that, that series. Um, but looking at how that might be treated graphically a little bit differently. And increasingly we're starting to make models of these things as a way of testing them. So this is a model we made with multi-axis milling. And then also using that multi-axis milling, although in this case it could be done with three axis, um, to look at bringing ornamental qualities back into the building. So this is, this is a wall, a timber wall, that's on the upper level of the building, um, and using an agent pattern simply as a generator of pattern. So while a lot of our work is trying to deal with the way multi-agent systems are negotiating between you know, structure and ornament and, um, and generation of form or spatial organization, this one is simply about generating patterns, um, which we're then milling out. Um, as a, as a form of relief. Uh, the next strategy is um, manifold swarms. So this goes back to the problem of uh, global ignorance. And the way, how, you can see that most of our projects, 
there's a lot of modeling going, like direct modeling going on at the level of form and um, space, and then a lot of the algorithmic work is actually to do with articulation or structure. Now, in this case, we wanted to try and develop a way of having emergent um, topology, so emergent sort of um, set of surfaces that make up space. Um, so, what we're doing is develop a series of behaviors that define the way agents relate to other agents around them in order to try and make a continuous, uh, continuous surface. It has this tendency to make surfaces which are quite um, uh, sort of like minimal surface like. So this is where we have start with two planes, which we disrupt, and then they need to reform. Um, we've also done this with cloud, which then flatten out to make surfaces. So it's a way of dealing with emergence at the level of space, rather than emergence at the level of um, some of those other concerns we had. So this is this was a project for the uh, Taipei New Museum, New Museum of New Taipei, um, accomplishment did about two years ago. And spatial topology is one which is emergent. We started to hybridize this strategy uh, with a tectonic strategy, with an agent body strategy. So you can see here that the agents are buzzing around, they're forming an emergent spatial topology, and then each of those agents gets bodied, and those bodies become the tectonics of the project. And they reach out, they grab onto each other, um, and they make a sort of continuous well, tectonic structure of forming. So it produces these types of um, forms and articulations. Uh, here's a test that we're looking at where we gradate from the surface through to, um, to the more complex geometries. And a series of studies, these were for the Alto um, University Architecture Building. Um, and this was looking at the relationship between knitted conditions and woven conditions and the way you could, you could go between the two. And this is partly a critique of a lot of parametric work that's been done recently, where you have smooth gradients of things. And the idea with this is that instead of grad gradating between two known conditions, we're interested in different conditions, or a way of something that could change in terms of um, its kind, and not just its degree, but so a sort of catastrophic change. But that catastrophic change would happen within the continuity. So there's, not, there's no breaking continuity, but there's a radical change in the type of conditions that occur. Uh, this was, so this was tested for the, uh, the skylight, this building, at the Outer University. <coughs> it's a roof and then we had another go at this in a project in Melbourne, my hometown. Uh, this is the, the competition for the Flynn Street station. And this is a train station that separates the city from the river. And so what was needed was a, a surface that would begin to relink the two. And so we're trying to, we have a surface which is trying to negotiate between the height of, of the bridge um, in the bank of the river, um, vault over the, um, the train lines. There's about 12 train tracks there and um, reconnect to the existing station. Uh, parts of this project were explicitly modeled in a similar way to the, um, the Green Roof of Taipei was. And then other parts of that were allowed to reform. And they're reforming using this manifold swarm and edge of body technique. And I guess this is an image that describes what's happening here. These surfaces began to delaminate and create a new, I guess, um, emergent geometry that shifts between different um, characteristics. But sometimes it's surface, sometimes it goes into a, almost a space. It's a bit hard to see in this monitor, but um, a sort of foam-like um, space frame. Which brings me to the final strategy, behavioral composites. And this is really an attempt to figure out how to build these types of images. And to, and to see whether this type of image is a pure fantasy or whether it's something which is um, realizable. Now, behavioral composites, this is an idea that if we're encoding design agency or design intention into geometry, and we're interested in that at the small scale, so a decision happens at the small scale, it generates things at the large scale, which of course we then evaluate and decide which ones are successful and feedback into that process. But I guess this brings up the question of what is that small scale? And is it the scale of a, of a column or a brick or, you know, or is it something that is the scale of sub-material? So in this case we're saying what happens if we look at what is the agency of the fibers that go into a fiber composite, for example. Um, so I'll quickly run through some of the 
history of that work. This is an um, image from one of the prototypes of Texas A&M. Um, this was from Tonji University. Um, A&M again. This is something from RMIT University, working with students, and from Kiwi Sotomayor's lab at Helsinki. Um, this is pretty most ornamental of them. <coughs> um, but this very important one I want to talk about, this is from about a year or so ago at um, this project we installed in a gallery in Melbourne. And we're we'll looking, so it's, a, it's an agent body project, it's a manifold swarm project, so it starts off with a cloud of agents, and those agents reform and they make a coherent topology in doing so. Um, but then we're also it wasn't an entirely bottom-up system. There were certain things that we liked about it and we would choose to sort of clamp. Like we, um, we then held some of these edges of the, kind of the wings or of the feet, um, and then, but then allowed other parts to reform more in some of these areas in the middle. Um, it's produced with a, an agent body that looks a little bit like this. So all the control points on those lines are um, agency and move around. Um, it has a skin as well, connected in certain topology. And I'll go through the process of making this thing. So we, we mill out a foam through by three <coughs> axis and, and then six axis milling. Mill a formwork for it, that form will get stuck together. Just out of polystyrene and a very limited budget in which to do this thing. Um, so it comes a bit of a complex three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. That gets coated in several layers of epoxy. Uh, and then we, we lay out the, the composite. So this is a couple of layers of glass fiber then the agent bodies go in, these sort of black and blue things, and they're made from um, they're made from expanded polys uh, polyurethane foam, and they're cast into molds, and they're flexible. So the idea is that we only have three different molds, but each of those those bodies can then be bent onto the onto the mold, and they have their legs that can be twisted and woven together to match the digital model, and the um, the template for where to lay those things is milled into the surface. So we sort of stick them where they're milled. Another few layers of fiberglass go on top. Uh, some, some other technical things like um, release film and um, infusion mesh. Um, vacuum bag goes at the top. A bunch of piping that makes it look like a weird science experiment. And that draws resin in through one pipe and pulls it out through the other pipes under vacuum. That's it during the, um, when it's under vacuum. And then all that red stuff gets ripped away and you're left with this very fine, um, in terms of thin, compressed composite. Um, the surface is less than, less than a millimeter thick, so it's 0.85 a mil. I don't know what that is in inches, but it's really thin. And the thing is about two and a half meters tall, so that's eight feet or something. Now, um, the fiberglass is not strong enough to support itself. It's incredibly flexible. The bodies themselves are incredibly flexible, they're floppy. Uh, but when they come together, they make a very strong, very stiff composite. And the reason for that is that um, the body imparts a series of corrugations on the surface. So its strength comes through, not through material, but through, through geometry. In the same way that sort of corrugated metal has strength over, over planar metal. This is where you rip off all the formwork. It's a bit sad because we spent so much time sanding and building this beautiful piece of formwork that you destroy with a hammer. And then this is the final thing. And you can see here, this is the, you can see the way that the glass, the very thin fiberglass, um, gets corrugations through these bodies. And I guess this is quite a good example of the way um, structural ornament and topology or form are totally intertwined. So the project needs its double curvature in order to have strength. So that's something built into the way the swarm, manifold swarm, is generated. Um, it needs these bodies for structure. It needs those bodies to be able to connect to each other and make continuous lines of structure through the project. So the behavior of those bodies are, are a structural condition. But of course, the, the bodies are also ornament. Um, they're ornamental things. And this is, so this is an example where we've We've compressed ornament structure, um, form, and I guess by implication of space into a single, <coughs> a single um, system and also a single assemblage, which isn't, is irreducible. 
Okay, so, so while our work is, is obviously deeply engaged in emergent process of design, we don't consider the work to have its value, or we don't consider the value to reside in its process. But, and I think this is a, this is a critique I have of a lot of algorithmic work where there's some belief that the internal consistency of the process is a form of objectivity. Like, has, or has some sort of, um, or the project has value because of the way that it was made. And this is something that we, we react against. Um, we think that the, the value of, our, of the work, if there is value in it, is not through its process, but it's through a series of, of I guess, strange um, qualities and characteristics. And we're, we're interested in exploring the architectural capacities and intricate characteristics that come out of this, this process that we describe as behavioral formation. Thank you.